Yes, there, there we is. go. Yay. There we go. Uh, John Feinstein joins us, I assume. Are you in uh, greater Washington, D.C.? I am in greater Washington, D.C., uh, Tom. The DMV is what they call it, Tom. <laughs> Yeah, that's not what I call it. No, but. of course not. <laughs> uh, before we get to your new book, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have one real quick plug, a, a title and topic, and then I want to get back to something else. Oh, what do, you, what do it, you got, John? Isn't he a wonderful interviewer? <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, just wrap it up so I can no, talk. I, 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 uh, well, we know Chick's not going to read it because it's not about the Washington football team uh, or whatever it's called you, these days. But hey, there's the, dancing look, in the street, Johnny. He's the, uh, oh, witch they is, are. the witch is dead, baby. <laughs> yeah, well, he's not quite dead, but uh, we've got our hands on the broom. That's right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, the new book, Tom, is cleverly called Ferrity because it is a biography of David Ferrity, who is one of the most fascinating and funny uh, and thoughtful people I've ever met in sports. A very good golfer. Uh, grew up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. A uh, very good golfer on the European tour, beat Payne Stewart in the Ryder Cup in the famous war by the shore, um, has had real tragedy in his life, lost his son to a drug overdose, um, and it became a TV star almost by accident when he went to work for CBS in the late 1990s. I've been friends with him for 30 years, and he and I finally decided about a year and a half ago that it was time to tell his story because it is, in fact, a remarkable story. Yeah, and he's also kind of one of these guys sort of all over the map, some of the stuff that he says. Yes, uh, he's gotten himself in trouble. He's got uh, some, He's got some like, fringe right wing, some fringe left wing. He's a... Yeah, he, he's, he's very much... He's, very, he's a moderate. Uh, he's certainly to the right of me because everybody is. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, he's, he made a crack about Nancy Pelosi years ago that got him in trouble. And that, that's the famous that's the famous elevator story, right? Exactly right. Um, and uh, he said that if if uh, <laughs> in America, David's done a lot of work for um, uh, wounded warriors uh, and created a, a group called Troops First that has raised more than thirty million dollars to help uh, former servicemen. And uh, he said that if a serviceman was on an elevator with Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> Osama bin Laden, and who was the uh, Senate Majority Leader at the time? I'm blocking on his name. Also, a oh, Democrat. Mitch, Mitch, uh, no, not Mitch McConnell. Oh, not Mitch McConnell. Oh, yeah, um, no, Mitch McConnell Democrat, Democrat. Uh, yeah, but Harry Reid. Harry Reid. Harry Reid. Harry Reid. Yeah. Must have. And, yeah. That uh, that when the elevator door opened, um, Bin Laden would be strangled and the other two would be shot. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it's meant to be a comical, but, but yeah. It was meant to be comical. He wrote it in a magazine story. None of the editors bothered to say, uh, David, maybe we don't want to say this. And of course he had to apologize profusely. And, and, and he says that it was a dumb comment and he shouldn't have made it, but he was trying, he was going for funny. Right, and David right. goes for funny a lot, and when you go for funny a lot, you guys know this. Sometimes you swing and miss. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh sometimes. <laughs> you haven't no. listened to the show enough. No, no, no. So he, I, I want to get back. I want to get back to your book. I just wanted to say I want to get to something else, and we'll get back to uh, John Feinstein and his book, which we were going to talk about. I, I was laughing this morning because. The NFL released a, uh, a press release about the fact that they're going to re be releasing a press release coming up Thursday. Yes. How I dare know. you? It's, I mean, really? Yeah, I, I, but they get away with it because yeah. you read the story, didn't you? Yeah, of you course. Saw story, certainly. And, you know, every, every year, you guys know this, yeah. um, they, when the NFL schedule comes out and it's live on, on ESPN and the NFL Network, there are literally talk show hosts around the country who sit there and go through their local team schedule game by game, predicting wins and losses. That's a win. That's a loss. That's a win. That's a win. Um, the NFL controls our lives. Uh, I'm not a huge fan, as you guys know, but you cannot uh, argue with the dominance of the league in our society. Yeah. Now, do, you, do you bet on anything? Oh, God, no. Oh, God, no. I, and, and, and it's not because of any great morality or anything. Um, I, I think I've told you this story before. I'll try to tell it briefly. Um, 1989, my then wife uh, was in an office pool for, you know, the NCAA basketball tournament. And she's filling it out based on team colors. And this coach is good looking and, you know, on and on. And I was staying away. And finally, she picked Seton Hall to beat Indiana in the round of 16. 
And I said, look, Mary, I'm not telling you what to do, but if there's one team I know something about, it's Indiana. And they aren't losing to Seton Hall. And she said, but my dad went to Seton Hall. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you do what you want, but I'm just telling you Indiana's going to win that game. <laughs> Seton Hall won by 20. And <laughs> went to the championship game, and Mary would have won the pool if I kept my mouth shut. And years later, she divorced me. So oh. <laughs> I stay away from all of that. Now, do you know any, I know names here, do you know any um, of your contemporaries uh, and your colleagues that are um, degenerate gamblers? I don't know if I describe anybody that I know as a degenerate gambler. You don't know my friends. <laughs> well, uh, but, but but maybe they are, and I don't know it. That's always possible. There's a radio show I do every Friday uh, here in D.C., and uh, the four guys who are the hosts are all gamblers. Um, mm. You know, they do they do betting shows and things like that, and host poker tournaments and and. So yes, I, I guess I know those four guys. I'm not. A, I'm not sure I'd call them degenerate, but they're certainly gamblers. If you were to gamble, how do you think you would do? Badly. Really? Badly. What, because what, what sport do you know the most about? Bas college basketball and, and golf is second. Um, and uh, but you know, in, in my in my mind, I'm always picking games during the season. I remember. I can't. Remember, oh, I know what it was. This season, Michigan State was playing Notre Dame. And Notre Dame wasn't any good. And Michigan State was good. And I, I saw the line somewhere. I, somebody told me the line. I can't remember. But I said, if I was going to bet, that's a game I bet a lot of money on Michigan State. They were, like, favored by four or something. And they lost by 20. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I don't bet, because I, I can't afford it. All right. We're, we're speaking with John Feinstein. And uh, John does have a new book out. And it's about David Faraday. And he's a fascinating guy. Really interesting, and he's had some uh, uh, some uh, mental health issues that he's tackled, among other things. Um, yes, he's, and, a, he's a recovering alcoholic, among other things. Yeah. Um, so tell us about the book. Well, as I said, I've known David for many years, dating back to when he was still playing. I first met him uh, at the British Open in 1994. He finished tied for fourth, and I walked out of the interview room on Saturday with a colleague of mine named Dave Shining, who at the time worked for the Miami Herald, and we introduced ourselves. And David looked at at, uh, um, at David Shining and said, "Miami Herald, do you know Carl Hyacin?" And I thought, "Wow, I don't know many athletes who read Carl Hyacin. <laughs> right? I don't know many athletes who read anything." But um, <laughs> I, I thought this guy's a little bit different, and and he was clearly so bright and, and thoughtful and funny. The two funniest people I've ever met in sports are Jim Bal the late Jim Balvano uh, and David Faraday. And got to know him over the years. And later when Tom Watson and I uh, started uh, a charity golf tournament for ALS research because Tom's caddy and my good friend Bruce Edwards died of ALS. You guys had me on for that book, Caddy for mm -hmm. Life. Um, David would come and speak. Couldn't play anymore because his back was so, so bad. But he would come to the dinner and speak. And literally, I'm not exaggerating, people would be falling out of their chairs laughing. Um, when, he, 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 when he went to work for CBS, um, he uh, always walked with the last group on Sunday. And frequently, that included Tiger Woods. Tiger doesn't like anybody, but he liked David. Hmm. And because David never asked him for anything. And he would tell David jokes. Tiger loves to tell off-color jokes. And he would pull his cap down. So the cameras couldn't read his lips. And he would say things to David like, hey, farty. He called him farty because the two of them love to engage in farting contests. Uh, I think that's how they bonded. Um, but uh, he'd say, what do you call a black guy flying an airplane? And David would say, I don't know, Tiger. What do you call a black guy flying an airplane? And Tiger would say, a pilot, you blanking racist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and David, he does a stand-up act in theaters uh, He for an hour and 40 minutes and then 20 minutes of questions. Most stand-ups, as you guys know, go for, what, 15, 20 minutes? He does an hour and 40 minutes. It's basically his life story, starting with growing up in Northern Ireland, um, talking about his dad, who, uh, according to David, was drunk the day he was born. And he was supposed to be named William David Faraday, but his father was drunk and signed the birth certificate, David William Faraday. 
Hmm. So that's why his name is David. Uh, <laughs> but um, just he had he had so many an hour and forty minutes of stand up. Just imagine that. And I, again, the night first night I saw him in Atlanta. Fortunately, I had an empty seat next to me. Because the woman, two seats over, literally fell over into the empty seat, <laughs> laughing so hard. So is, he, is he, in effect, the co-writer of this? No, he's not. I mean, he and I discuss. I mean, he is in the sense that his stories are a huge part, of, and his story is a huge part. It's biography of the book. But when we, he and I discussed doing the book, um, he was insistent on, uh, on two things. One, he didn't want to be paid. Um, David's made a lot of money. And he's very comfortable financially, especially now since he went to work for LIV uh, last July. But even then, he was very comfortable financially. He said, you're going to do the work. Um, I don't want you to pay me. And more important to me, well, at least as important, um, he said he agreed with me that the book would be better written in a third person because it allowed me to do more reporting. It allowed me to talk to his wife, Anita, to his son Rory coincidence with McElroy, uh, daughter Erin, best friends in life growing up, his mom who's still alive uh, at 92 and has a wicked sense of humor, if you, if you wonder where David got it. Um, David tells a story about his father coming home late one night. Dinner was always served at six o'clock sharp. And his father walks in and says, uh, is my dinner still warm? And Mrs. Faraday says, absolutely, it's in the dog's stomach. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking with, with John Feinstein. John is a great writer. Um, to get away from the new book for just a second, are you still working on any, me, Tom. On any uh, <laughs> and, well, I, I'm not going to let you just get, pitch this book the whole time. What do you think I am? Uh, this isn't the... <laughs> Why not? What am I paying you for? <laughs> yeah. I was just kind of curious. Are you working on any more young people's fiction? I, I always enjoy no. those. Sadly, at the moment, I'm not. Um, the My editor uh, at Macmillan retired, and um, I haven't been able to find a new editor, to be honest with you. Um, mm. I actually dealt with one editor who wrote back to my agent and said I was too old to write children's books, which oh. I, think, mm. I think that's ageism. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, 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 I don't think I have a lawsuit there, unfortunately. And then another editor um wrote because i one of the books i proposed was a basketball book that you know, to write a book about basketball you need a a poc um oh, yeah sure yes. i don't i didn't a person I of color right? I was, what's a poc person of color of course but um and, and i'm like i've been writing basketball my entire life yeah <laughs> you know, non-fiction um uh, you know, two two of the groomsmen at my first wedding were black, and you know, on and on and on. But so I'd like to write another children's book, um, but at the moment I'm not. Okay, we're talking with John Feinstein, and his new book is about David Faraday. And um, uh, what do you think of the whole live golf thing? Well, I mean, you know, there's a part of me uh, that is disgusted by the whole thing. Um, it's clearly sports washing. There, there's no question about it. Um, they're not the only ones to do it. It's China does it. Russia's done it. Um, many, many people do it. The NBA is heavily involved in China, uh, as we all know. Um, and it, it, but they've hosted and they, they have hosted golf tournaments over there for many years. Uh, the flip side of it is when you look at the money that they've offered players and David Faraday, uh, among others. Um, you you have to sit back and say I, I can sort of understand I don't necessarily like that they're taking the money but what would I do if I was offered that kind of stupid money I, I the honest answer is I don't know I'd like to think I'd say oh no I'm above all that um, but uh, when you're dealing with ageism and racism at, at my age maybe you'd have to think about it uh, and that's what happened with David um, he was going into the last year of his contract with NBC. NBC was uh, getting rid of older guys. They, they retired Roger Maltby. They retired Gary Cope. David was very aware of that. He's 64 um, and wondered what his future with NBC was going to be. So when Greg Norman came to him and offered ridiculously stupid money, 
um, he, he ended up taking it. He thought about it long and hard. He actually read uh, the 9-11 Commission's uh, report on 9-11, uh, and, and which said that the Saudis were not involved in 9-11, although there have been other reports since that say they were. Um, but um, I wrote to him because I was right near the end of writing the book when this happened. And I sent him a note and I said, seriously, I have to rewrite the last two chapters so you can make a measly couple million extra dollars. <laughs> and he wrote me back and said, it isn't a measly couple million extra dollars. So there you go. Uh, hard John, for me to be critical. John, yeah. good luck with the book. Um, I'm going to read it. Yeah, wait to read it. Uh, I I've always enjoy your stuff. It's uh, very engaging, even on topics I don't know or think I care about. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, 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 let me say this, Tom, um, because Mike Krzyzewski, I saw Mike Krzyzewski the other night at a dinner where he was honored with the Dean Smith Award um, for being, for living up to Dean Smith's uh, life, not for winning 1,202 games. And, and, and he asked me about, the Faraday book and Mike's not a golfer. Um, but he said he'd like to read it because he knows about David's life and he thinks it would be interesting to read about David, the person. And I think that's what this book is. It's not a golf book. I mean, David was a golfer and talks about golf for a living, but it's, I think it's a lot more than a golf book. And, and you, you know, Tom, cause you've read a bunch of my books and chick, you know, because Christie's read you a bunch of my books. <laughs> I uh, told you that story in confidence, John. I don't know why. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, but um, but I try to write more about people who just happen to be in sports than about sports. Yeah, and, and uh, I'll give you a, a plug here. A great Father's Day gift, by the way, for yes. those uh, for Coming those up that in are June. desperate, desperate. What? How can I get something else? He's got. He's already got the golf bag <laughs> umbrella holder. I need to get him something. A great book from John Feinstein would be the way to go. Hey, thanks, John. It's always a great pleasure. Thanks, guys. I always enjoy it. Thanks for having me. Sure. Let's talk again soon, okay? You. Thank you, buddy.